Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Wilkins, and I'm the Director of Creative Writing at Linfield University. I'd like to welcome you to this year's digital installment of readings not exactly at the NIC, but from the NIC, maybe, a partnership between the English Department and the Nicholson Library. Today, we are truly delighted to bring you Ross Gay, a tremendous poet and essayist, and, a, a, and a, just a great soul. A um, couple of thank yous first to Ginny Blackson, Michael Bacchus, and everyone at the Nicholson Library. The series simply wouldn't work without you. To Travis McGuire, Kathy Foss, and Media Relations, thanks for getting the word out and for navigating these new technological waters. For that, I am especially grateful. This year in my poetry writing, we're writing, we're writing Ross Gay's collection of poems, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. My students, most of whom are here on the Zoom and will be asking Ross some tough, wise questions here in just a bit, um, <laughs> just handed in their Ross Gay inspired poems and they were beautiful and wild and full of delights. Um, beyond poetry, of course, Ross is also an essayist and across this pande pandemic, I've been pressing his book of essays, The Book of Delights into the hands of just about everyone I know. So I'm super thrilled to host him here at Linfield for a reading. For a fuller intro though, I'd like to turn it over to senior creative writing major, Gretel Valdez. All right, hi everyone. Welcome and again, thank you for joining us and welcoming the wonderful poet, Ross Gay. Um, a little bit about Gay. Gay is the author of four books of poetry, including a catalog of unabashed gratitude, which we read in our poetry class, as Joe said. Um, it won the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award and the 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. He's also the author of a collection of essays, as Joe mentioned, The Book of Delights. Gay has also really received numerous fellowships um, and he, is, uh, he teaches at the Indiana University. Gay's work is phenomenal in the way that it leaves you with such a breathless urgency to take in his writing and listen to what he has to say, whether it is about the fruits you neglect in your garden or the human rights we see taken away daily via the internet. I more than appreciate the perspectives Gay's work has given myself and others, I'm sure, in my class. Um, so from his collection on a catalog of unabashed gratitude, I was enthralled with how many ways one person can breathe so much life into such serious moments of life and death. Um, particularly the poem Burial for me resonated so well because you've literally brought your father back to life in planting a tree. Uh, it reminded me to appreciate the little things about my dad's laugh or his presence and all the things that annoy me now one day will just be memories. I'm very grateful for those, for that awakening um, and realization that there's so much to be grateful for as your collection is self-titled as. That being said, this gratitude and there's so much gratitude in the world and especially in your wor words, myself and others have become that much more attuned to said gratitude from the poems you graced us with. Um, and without further ado, Ross Gay. Thank you, Gretel. That was beautiful, really beautiful. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna, um, yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks, Joe, for having me. Um, I'm gonna dive in here and yeah, if anyone wants to like un, unmute your camera, your picture, if anyone wants to do that, that would be fine and slash generous for me. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna read, I'm gonna kind of probably go back and forth between poems and essays-ish. Um, and I'll go for about 40 minutes or so, and then, then we can do our Q&A. And this is called Ode to the Puritan in Me. There is a Puritan in me, the brim of whose hat is so sharp, it could cut your tongue out. With a brow so furrowed, you could plant beets or turnips or something, of course, good for storing. He has not taken a nap since he was two years old because he detests sloth above all. He is maybe the only real person I've ever heard say sloth or detest in conversation. He reads poetry, the Puritan in me, with an exacto knife in his calloused hand, if not a stick of dynamite. And if the Puritan in me sees two cats making whoopee in the barn, I think not because they get in the way or scare the cows, but more precisely because he thinks it is worthless, the angles of animals fucking freely in the open air, he will blast them to smithereens. I should tell you, 
The Puritan in me always carries a shotgun. He wants to punish the world, I suppose, because he feels he needs punishing for how many, how, for who knows how many unpunishable things. Like the times as a boy, he'd sneak shirtless between the cows to haul his tongue across the salt lick or how he'd study his dozing granny's instep like it was the map of his country. Or the spring nights he'd sneak to the, to the garden behind the sleeping house and strip naked while upon him lathered the small song of the ants rasping their tongues across the peony's sap, making of his body a flower dappled tree while above him the heavens wheeled and his tongue drowsed slack as a creek on the banks of which, there he is, right now, the Puritan in me, tossing his shotguns into the cattails, taking off his boots and washing his feet in that water. And this one, I'm gonna read this poem, uh, it's called Weeping. <laughs> so there's a little story about this. Um, maybe I'll say it first, two stories. I'll tell one first and then the other one second. So the first one is that this poem, Weeping, it starts with this kind of uh, etymology. I do the etymology of the word weeping, but it's, a, it's what we call in the business a bullshit etymology. I'm making it up. And at one point I was someplace and um, there was someone who's, uh, <laughs> I want to say studied like the dark ages. A, they call it medievalists. <laughs> <laughs> they did Chaucer and shit, you know, they read Chaucer and stuff. And they were excited because they were like, yeah, I was going to read at some other school and they knew some other like medievalists at that school. And they were like, yeah, like they were, we were having this debate about this etymology you did at the beginning of that poem. And I was like, oh, that, that bullshit. <laughs> anyway, this is called Weeping. I'm thinking here of the Proto-Indo-European. If you want to convince someone, say Proto-Indo-European. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking here of the Proto-Indo-European root, which means the precise sound of a flower bud unwrapping, and the tiny racket a seed makes cracking open in the dark, which has evolved in a handful of Latinate languages to mean the sound of lovers exiting each other, implying as well the space between them, which usage is seen first in Dante in the 14th century, elbowing it for good into our mouths and minds. And of course, the sweet bead of sugar, the sweet bead of sugar imperceptibly moseying from the fig's tiny eye, precisely unlike sorrow, which the assembly of insects sipping there will tell you. When I tell you, my niece, without fit or wail, knowing her friend Emma had left and not said goodbye, having spent the better part of the day resting on her finger, sometimes opening her wings, which were lustrous brown with gold spots, to steady herself at the child-made gale, or when she was tossed into the air while my niece took her turn at pickup sticks until calling Emma down by holding her finger in the air to which Emma would wobble. And Michaela said, deal us in, when we broke out the dominoes, at which they made a formidable duo, whispering to each other instructions and while the adults babbled our various dooms, Michaela and Emma went into the bedroom where they sang and danced. And I think I heard Michaela reading Emma her favorite book, both of them slapping their thighs, leaning into each other. And at bedtime, Michaela put on her PJs carefully, first the left arm through while Emma teetered on the right, then the other. And in the dark, Michaela whispered to Emma, who had threaded her many legs into the band of Michaela's sleeve while she drifted, watching Emma's wings slowly open and close. And Emma must have flown away for good, judging from the not brutal silence at breakfast as Michaela chewed the waffle goofily with her one front tooth gone and weakly smiled, looking into the corners of the room for her friend, for Emma who had left without saying goodbye, the tears easily rolling from her eyes when I say she was weeping, when I say she wept. So the, the little story behind that poem is that um, I remember when some of my nieces and my brother and his wife were visiting and 
it was the last day, it was the morning, they were getting ready to leave. And, you know, the day before we'd had this whole kind of lovely experience with Emma. And, but I'd forgotten about that. And the next morning when my niece was like, we, you know, she just kept crying, just like tears just rolling down her face, no big deal. And I was like, ah, oh, she's, she's really sad that she has to leave her uncle, her uncle Rossi. And then it turned out she was sad because of Emma. <laughs> It had nothing to do with me, <laughs> which is good. I was like, well done, well done. You got your priorities right. Um, I'm gonna read this one about um, this little essay here. This is called Inefficiency. So the Book of Delights, this is a book of essays for those of you who don't know that I wrote um, from one year. I was walking home someplace and I was having a lovely day and it was, a, I felt delighted. The experience that sort of came to my ear was like, oh, this is a delight. And I was like, oh, I should write a little essay about this. And then I thought, no, it'd be neat to write an essay every day for a year about something that delighted me, which I did. I decided oh, I'm gonna do that. And I did it on August 1st, my birthday, and for a year until, this is August 1st, 2016 that I started it. It was an interesting year. All years are interesting years. Um, and it's called, uh, this This is the second one, and it's called Inefficiency. It's kind of neat because you do it for a year, like I learned how to write essays a lot better over the course of a year. And so an early one is like, okay, I'm still getting it, feeling it out. Inefficiency. I don't know if it's the time I've spent in the garden, spent an interesting word, which is somehow an exercise in supreme attentiveness, staring into the oregano blooms, wending through the lowest branches of the gumi bush, and the big vascular leaves of the rhubarb, and also an exercise in supreme inattention, or distraction, I should say, or fleet intense attentions, I should say, or intense fleeting attentions. Did I mention the hummingbird hovering there with its green gold breast shimmering, slipping its needle nose in the zinnia and zoom? Mention the pokeweed berries dangling like jewelry from a flapper mid-step? Mention the little black jewels of deer scat and the deer-shaped depressions in the grass and red clover, uh-oh. I come from people for whom, as I write this, lounging, sipping coffee, listening to the oatmeal talking in the pot, inefficiency was not mostly an option, I suppose, given being kind of broke and hustling to stay afloat with two kids and a car always breaking and their own paper routes on top of their jobs and such does not so much afford the delight of inefficiency. Though being broke and hustling to stay afloat most certainly occasions other mostly undelightful inefficiencies, such as my dad driving from Philadelphia to Youngstown, Ohio every year to re-register his car in a state where they didn't have inspections because his 1978 Toyota Corolla, in my mind, one of the most beautiful cars ever made, the wagon, I mean, had two doors that didn't open and a hole in the floor that was more or less a lattice work of rust. For instance, I love not getting the groceries in from the car in one trip. Or better yet, I love walking around a city, ostensibly trying to get somewhere, perhaps without all the time in the world, perhaps with, and despite the omniscient machine in my pocket frying my sperm, vibrating to remind me of said frying, just wandering. Maybe it's down this street. Maybe it's down this one. Maybe you're with a friend. And maybe the inefficiency will make you closer. Maybe it's a cafe you're looking for on Cambridge Street, which evidently doesn't exist until drifting along, it does. And right down this block, across the street from a school where a trio of kids, black girl with braids, brown girl in a hijab, and a white girl with pigtails are shooting hoops. In one of my recurring dreams, I'm hurrying somewhere, trying to be efficient, to an airport or work and just up the road, always up a hill and often around a bend, feels like parts of Pittsburgh or San Francisco or sometimes very clearly Philadelphia, is a restaurant with the best veggie burger and French fries. The fries are thick, very crispy, naturally have the skins on and are creamy inside. The veggie burger holds together, is handmade, probably with about six ingredients in it, including the spices. The roll, superb. The decor, who knows? I should remind you that I've never actually been there. I should also let you know that when my partner Stephanie opened her exquisite vegetarian cafe, Pulp, the dream subsided. 
I got lots of those veggie burgers for real cheap. And the week before she sold it, the dreams came back. And there I go, past the turnoff to the veggie burger on the hill, <laughs> Zoom, being efficient, Zoom, being getting something important done, Zoom, being productive, Zoom, as just up the hill and around the bend waits a simple delight, a slow and abiding delight, the passing of which usually only gets me to an airport where, in the dream, I almost always miss my flight. And if I don't, the plane will fall from the sky. <sighs> um, and I'm going to read this one too. Um, this is the fourth one I wrote. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all a secret. <laughs> it's just ridiculous enough that I should tell you. Um, I had this idea for a book project <laughs> where I was like, I'm going to go find that veggie burger. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's like one of my main dreams. I, even when I was reading that, I was like, oh, I think I might have been looking for that thing last night. Um, like, and it's just a book about going to find that veggie. <laughs> just remember that I said that. Um, okay, so this is called Blowing It Off. When I began this gathering of essays, which, yes, comes from the French essay, meaning to try or to attempt, I planned on writing one of these things, these attempts, every day for a year. When I decided this, I was walking back from my lodging in a castle, delight, from two very strong espressos at a cafe in Umbertide, delight, having just accidentally pilfered a handful of loquats from what I thought was a public tree, but upon just a touch more scrutiny was obviously not, delight, and sucking on the ripe little fruit turning the smooth gems of their seeds around my mouth as wild fennel fronds wisped in the breeze on the roadside. A field of sunflowers stretched to the horizon, casting their seedy grins to the sun above, the honeybees in the linden trees thick enough for me not only to hear but to feel in my body the sun like a guiding hand on my back saying everything is possible, everything. My mother, who has not always been keen on praise, has these days, for some reason, been praising my discipline. Maybe it's because I have a kettlebell practice or I never eat bacon. But since she says it, and she's my mom, I tend to think it must be true. The first essay or try or attempt that I skipped was on day four. Believe me, I had good reason for blowing it off. I can't remember it now, but it was convincing. Probably I got tired and thought, oh, I'll just write two tomorrow. Except when tomorrow actually came around, I was daunted at the prospect of trying two in the same day. One try is hard enough. What if both attempts were awful? I'm dramatizing what was probably the minutest chatter in the Siberia of my mind. So deep, I doubt I even heard it. Or instead, perhaps I quickly revised my position to regard the occasional lack of discipline. Let me call it failure. No, let me call it blowing it off into a delight. Rather than putting Ross on the rack and whipping him with a cat of nine tails, what is that? And pouring alcohol all over the wounds, antiseptic? And then flicking matches at him and telling him to dance, you lazy, worthless goat turd. Are you asking how can one be on the rack and dance at once? Me too. I decide, Despite all the disciplinarians breaststroking the slick and gooey folds of my noggin, double fisting sickles, swinging at anything that looks too glad to just blow it off. And apropos ancillary delight, the word whatevs. I was probably absent five times in 13 years of primary school, despite having had two surgeries and pretty serious asthma, breaking a few bones and not infrequently falling hard on my face. I had a paper route for most of those 13 years and literally, not like the kids say literally, I mean literally, never skipped a day, even after the night when I was about an hour away with a new lover, curled into a ball fingering each other after gallivanting barefoot in a thunderstorm. And I would have rather died than miss basketball practice, the first part of which I did in fact miss two days before the playoff game against Upper Marion where I had to be prepared because they also had a big old bruiser in the post. And we won by seven, but still, I woke in a panic and got there fast as I could on the verge of tears, apologizing profusely to Coach Simon. And about a week before my old man was diagnosed with liver cancer, I was hanging around the house when he was getting ready to head out to his job at Applebee's. 
I said, oh man, blow it off. Let's go watch Hellboy. He looked at me wistfully while tucking in his shirt and sliding his belt through the loops. You have no idea how bad I wish I could. That was the first time he'd said anything like that. I was 29. And so in honor and love, I delight in blowing it off. This is called Burial. And when I'm uh, give this, when I read this poem in in a live setting, which I guess this is, um, I say I ask if anyone's done anything with their um, placenta, and uh, let's do it. Has anyone done anything with the placenta? And I don't know who you know who owns the placenta. If ownership is the right word, I think it's really not. <laughs> But so Jesse, uh, did you raise your hand? Well, I can't speak to my placenta, um, but my wife's is uh, was weirdly turned into a pill that was supposed to help her not have um, postpartum depression. Oh yeah, I heard about and that. And she decided it didn't work. And then um, <laughs> it, was en it was encapsulated. And then uh, the second one we, we put underneath a tree, which isn't something else that people do. Thank you. Burial. You're right, you're right, the fertilizer's good. It wasn't a gang of dullards came up with chucking a fish in the planting hole or some midwife got lucky with a placenta. Oh, I'll plant a tree here. And a sudden flush of quince and jam enough for months. Yes, the magic dust our bodies become cast spells on the roots about which someone else can tell you the chemical processes, but it's just magic to me which is why a couple springs ago, when first putting in my two bare root plum trees out back, I took the jar which has become my father's house and lonely for him and hoping to coax him back for my mother as much as me, poured some of them in the planting holes. And he dove in, glad for the robust air, saddling a slight gust into my nose and mouth, chuckling as I coughed, but mostly he disappeared into the minor yawns in the earth into which I placed the trees, splaying wide their roots and casting the gray dust of my old man evenly throughout the hole, replacing then the clods of dense Indiana soil until the roots and my father were buried, watering it all in with one hand while holding the tree with the other straight as the flag to the nation of simple joy of which my father is now a naturalized citizen waving the fat flag from his subterranean lair. The roots curled around him like shawls or jungle gyms, like hookahs or the arms of ancestors, before breaststroking into the xylem, riding the elevator up through the cambium and into the leaves where, when you put your ear close enough, you can hear him whisper, good morning. Where if you close your eyes and push your face, you can feel his stubbly jowls and good Lord, this year he was giddy at the first real fruit set and nestled into the 30 or 40 plums in the two trees, peering out from the sweet meat with his hands pressed against the purple skin like cathedral glass. And imagine his joy as the sun wizarded forth those abundant sugars and I plodded barefoot and prayerful at the first ripe plum swell and blush, almost weepy, conjuring some surely ponderous verse to convey this bottomless grace, you know, oh father, oh father kind of stuff. Hundreds of hot air balloons filling the sky in my chest, replacing his intubated body, listing like a boat keel side up replacing the steady stream of water from the one eye, which his brother wiped before removing the tube, keeping his hand on the forehead until the last wind in his body wandered off while my brother wailed like an animal. And my mother said, weeping, it's okay. It's okay, you can go, honey. At all of which my father guffawed by kicking from the first bite buckets of juice down my chin, staining one of my two button down shirts, the salmon colored silk one, hollering, there's more of that. Almost dancing now in the plum, in the tree, the way he did as a person, bent over and biting his lip and chucking the one hip out and then the other 
with his elbows cocked and fists loosely made and eyes closed and mouth made trumpet when he knew he could make you happy just by being a little bit silly and sweet. Let me give you another one of these essays here. Oh, I'm gonna read this one. I haven't read this in a little bit. It's called Remission Still. I just got the sweetest textual message from my friend Walt. It read, I love you breadfruit. I don't know the significance of this particular fruit, though I have recently learned that it is related to the mulberry, which is unequivocally among the most noble and delicious of fruits. A few years back, my friend Walt became intensely agoraphobic. He was afraid he'd be walking down the tree-lined streets near his house on Spring Garden and a bus would hop the curb and take him out. Or a limb rotted from the inside might drop on him from one of those trees or lightning or the earth itself might throw open its ravenous mouth. It happens and gobble him up. Perhaps it's no surprise that precisely seven years prior to the onset of this acute terror, what was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia, which at the time offered a seven year survival rate, which actually means you have seven years to live, seven years until you're dead. I remember the day Walt was diagnosed. We were going to meet at Tai Lake in Chinatown for a late night dinner. And he left a message on the answering machine that he'd had blood work at his checkup and his doctor sent him immediately to Hahnemann Hospital where they made me wear a mask and booties to see him while they sucked his blood out of one arm, whirled it around in a machine and put it back in the other arm in a stopgap measure called leukapheresis. He felt okay, but his white blood cells were a mess. His folks were there looking nervous in their masks and gowns on a couch across the room. Walt's already high pitched laugh was a few notes higher and a bit thinner. The mask here is interesting huh? it, to be in a, you know. Walt's already high pitched laugh was a few notes higher and a bit thinner as he watched what was happening to his blood. When the treatment was done, he gave me his blessing to indulge at Thai Lake to eat the Peking pork chops on his behalf, which I did with the Ang Choi, most likely. It was by now about 1 a.m. And in that very full and loud and smoky restaurant, I ate one of the loneliest meals of my life. I went with Walt to get a second opinion from my uncle, an oncologist who palpated Walt's newly extra lovable tummy and ran blood work which returned the same results. So the survival rate is seven years, Uncle Roy said. It must have been something like my father whom Walt adored telling him he'd be dead in seven years. And maybe it was something like me saying it. There I go, putting myself in the middle of everything. I guess I could just ask Walt. Without getting too deep into the unabashed turmoil of interferon, Someone should not do a Marina Abramovician performance by injecting this toxic drug, experiencing flu-like symptoms, et cetera, which was so severe, so awful that after a two week break from the poison keeping him alive, which the doctors call a vacation, beware anything called a vacation that isn't actually a vacation. Walt, at the thought of going back on the stuff, walked his ass into the psych ward lest he put a hole in his head. Walt needed to feel bad like he needed a hole in his head. Walt needed to feel better. And so when a drug called Gleevec was introduced about five years into Walt's illness, it occasioned a kind of remission for a lot of people, Walt included. It seems to work so well that it cures about half of the people. Walt might be one of them. Despite that remission, when seven years had passed and pre-Gleevec, he was supposed to be dead he got real scared he was going to die, which he did not. Uh, this is this is a uh, roll with this segue. segue. It's called Last Will and Testament. Uh, this is the last poem in this book. So it's sort of like, you know, you'll get it. You thought somehow you were off the hook. I guess so, I just wanna say, I think I must have written this poem and I started like that. You thought somehow you were off the hook because the last, the title poem is very long, you know, and it's like a lot of, a lot of energy in that title poem. And then 
so I guess I'm probably being like, we're not done yet, <laughs> like that. I just don't read this phone very often, so I'm just processing with you. Thank you for indulging me. Last will and testament. You thought somehow you were off the hook, which was naive, if not dumb. Though I will not berate you, given as this poem is in fact me on my knees to beg of you a small grody chore. And though you may not know the ways my lucky body corrodes, nor what stray bricks heave from what stray roofs are headed my way, nor I yours, Degrade I do, and so am here to plead the lucky sod, lover, pal, niece, mom, Lord God, please not mom, charged with heaving my luggage to chuck the gore straight into the orchard. Beats me by dry flame or cauldron deep, by your granny's mortar and pestle to grind my bones and teeth, having flayed and woven of my flesh two or three mats of mulch. Do the good work with your pickaxe or hacksaw. Oh, for God's sake, have a little fun with this grave and grisly drill and know I'm giggling too and feel nary a thing. And when you've lopped what needs lopping, oh, use the hand pruners with the red handle. They were my favorite. Such elegant recoil, such scintillant snips. Chuck my at last acheless feet to the fickle peach. My hands upturned and open to the village of figs where the ants pray for fruit slather face. My jawbone yoked to its tongue, planted as a small forgiveness of stupid, lonely, frightened Samson and his stupid, lonely, frightened God. And as some meager balm to the donkey he defamed, give that to the black mulberry, tree of forgiveness, tree of bounty. Lob my head and its vaults of perfectly useless mud to the persimmon, where the bleak cold coaxes forth the sugars shining in the long dark. And my heart, go ahead and tuck beneath some comfrey sprawling across the plum tree's feet, so I might dance a long and lonely tango with my old man. Lord knows I don't wish to go just yet, for the flush of flowers and then fruit blooms me into a cartwheel that whirls for weeks. Not to mention my knees little ditties are still mostly pretty. And good Lord, the funks I stumble over lust drunk and hungry walking the streets of most cities. And some days I wake up tonguing the laminated pages of the world map. But when I do head out, I won't be like the old man who wept as he died wheeled through his orchard the last time, whispering goodbye, goodbye, running his thin hands over the gnarled twining of vines, listening this last time to the wind through his lemons and oranges, the occasional thump of wind-fallen fruit, the night's scarce light unspooling through the leaves. Goodbye, child. Goodbye, little one, he says teetering out of his chair to clutch and rub his neck and cheek against the calloused bulk of the olive, which curls into him, the one lank branch cradling him, its thin leaves whispering. For some days, I can't wait to sling my gangly bulk into the peach blossom sheer camisoles or to become the frilly skirts of the pear, which wind blown heave the syrupy smell of semen. And oh, the joy I will be wafting into the noses and tongues of passersby who will furrow their brows before some of them crafting their various rackets with their loves or themselves. Thanks in no small part to me or to shimmy into the pawpaws steeple where my rank bloom, tongue kissed by flies, puckers at the gorgeous world, its brazenly human lips, not to mention, yes, of course, to be gobbled by the folks, the likes of whom I've never imagined. I'm saying, I'm saying to gift of my body some pure glee, which living, I don't know that I ever did except last spring, distracting the neighbor cat just enough to free the hummingbird in its paws. Or the ramshackle salsa my pal, salsa my pal and I stepped at a cafe in Greece where the music was good and the white aproned workers stomped and howled and sent us off with bags of cookies. Oh, and maybe another thing or two, but you get my point, friend. 
which getting to I know was a long road to hoe, <laughs> though I'm simply extolling your transubstantiative gift to me and whomever's heart will be a little broke when I kick it. But if you think this was blabber mouth, you better buckle in when I kick it. <laughs> Let me read you a couple more essays here. Um, this is called the high five from strangers. Today, I was wandering the square of the small Indiana town where I gave a poetry reading at the local college, a feature of the small town Midwest. I wanted to say that last poem. So one of my teachers is a guy named Thomas Lux. Joe, I have to imagine that you knew Thomas Lux's poem, so. You know, Tom Lux, this is a beautiful poem. He has this beautiful poem and I think I'm, I'm kind of riffing on his poem without even knowing I was doing it, which I'm always doing. Um, and it's something like honey, like, you know, embalm me in honey. I don't know what it is, you know, but it's like, it's a sort of, it's a love poem. Um, but I just wanted to mention Thomas Lux, Tom Lux, the beloved. Today I was wandering the square of the small Indiana town where I gave a poetry reading at the local college, a feature of the small town Midwest, a city hallish building in the center, always with some sad statue trumpeting one war or another. This one had a guy in one of those not very protective looking hats they called a helmet during World War I. He's carrying, naturally, a gun. Jenna Osman's book, Public Figures, alerted me to the ubiquity of the gun, the weapon, in the hands of our statues. A delight I wish to now imagine and even impose, given that beneficent dictatorship, of one's own life anyway, is a delight. All new statues must have in their hands flowers, or shovels, or babies, or seedlings, or chinchillas. We can go on like this for a while. But never ever guns. I decree it and also decree the removal of the already extant guns. Let the emptiness our war heroes carry be the metaphor for a while. As I was finishing circling the square, I passed a storefront garage with huge Make America Great Again signs. It was a foreign auto repair shop and inside were mostly Toyotas and Hondas. I settled in the coffee shop, took my notebooks out and I was reading over these delights, transcribing them into my computer. And while I was working, Headphones on, swaying to the new De La Soul record, Delight, which deserves its own entry. I noticed a white girl, she looked 15, but could have been, I suppose, a college student, standing next to me with her hand raised. I looked up, confused, pulled my headphones back, and she said, like a coach or something, working on your paper? Good job to you, high five. And you better believe I high fived that child in her pre-ripped Def Leppard shirt and her itty bitty Doc Martens. <laughs> For I love, I delight in unequivocally pleasant public physical interactions with strangers. What constitutes pleasant, it's no secret, is informed by my large-ish male and cisgender body. A body that is also large-ish male cisgender and not white. In other words, the pleasant, the delightful are not universal. We should all understand this by now. A few months ago, walking down the street in Umberto in Italy, a trash truck pulled up beside me and the guy in the passenger seat yelled something I didn't understand. I said, como? The Spanish word for come again, which is a ridiculous thing to say because even if, I had, if he had come again, I would not have understood him. He knew this and hopping out of the truck to dump in a couple cans, he flexed his muscles, pointed at me and smacked my biceps hard twice. I loved him. Or when a waitress puts her hand on my shoulder, forget if she calls me honey, baby even better. Someone scooting by puts their hand on my back, the handshake, the hug, I love them both. Once I was getting on a plane and shuffling down the aisle, I saw sitting at the front of coach, reading a magazine, my great uncle Earl. I got down on my knees and put my hand on his forearm and I said, uncle Earl, it's me, Ross. He looked at me kind of quizzically as did the woman traveling with him who did not look one bit like my aunt Sylvia, which made me look back at my not uncle Earl who looked maybe like my uncle Earl's second cousin 20 years ago. And though it was benign and no one was hurt, it was a little weird and they looked confused. All the same, given his uncle Earl died about six months later, I'm delighted I got to see him. 
and touch him gently, lovingly, about a thousand miles away. Um, maybe I'll read like two more. We're good with time? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna read this, <laughs> what's this one called? Um, to the mistake it's called. So partly because I just, um, I was just talking to my buddy in uh, the other night um, and uh, <laughs> he was with me during this mistake. But um, so the story, so you get this, just so you get it. I made the real bad mistake once <laughs> of <laughs> taking a bunch of LSD like right before um, this, is, you know, the, right before I went to, you're not gonna believe it, the reunion of the gifted and talented children, my senior year of high school. So like my middle school, <laughs> I really stopped being gifted and talented in like eighth grade, <laughs> but they still let me in from seventh grade. <laughs> and I just, I just made a mistake. I just thought, okay, this is probably just going to be like a thing. It wasn't, I didn't even drink, I didn't drink alcohol, I didn't smoke weed, I didn't do anything. But here it is, I take two tabs of acid. For those of you who don't know, I just was, I had a different mind state for the day. Um, this is called To the Mistake. It is good to know a thing or two about that of which you speak. So I'm talking, I'm like sort of imagining talking to my students in a big old lecture poetry class. It is good to know a thing or two about that of which you speak, or even to be expert, which is not requisite, though a thing or two is good. Like the prop plane I know is going to land on the canvas roof of my friend's rickety Jeep, while the salutatorian to be sits in the back seat giddy with her new graphing calculator. And the driver says something, I think about Arsenio Hall, but he sounds like a bunny in an echo chamber. It's hard to hear with those propellers roaring above. And today I'm lecturing my poetry class on the miracle of the mistake in a poem. That hiccup or weird gift that spirals or jettisons what's dull and landlocked into as yet untraversed, i.e. cosmic, I overuse this metaphor with my students, grounds. I tell this to 105, give or take, undergrads who mostly don't care and wrestle second to second the by now blood-borne drive to check their beckoning phones, which mostly bless them they don't. The mistake I say is a gift, don't be afraid. See what it teaches you about what the poem can be. I know of what I speak, like the two tabs of very potent, evidently acid I dropped four hours before this reunion and graduation party of sorts for we the gifted and talented, corn chips and Mr. Pib and store-bought cookies, the texture of which sunk me knee deep in a desert. I imagine I looked something like an opaque cloud when that day when Mr. and Mrs. Simonoski, our brainy hosts and teachers guffawed in claymation, the tremendous bead of spit balancing on Mr. Simonoski's lip before a gust of air lifted it and it drifted to the coarse fabric of his beard, all the spiny hairs of which seemed to screech like crickets. And no wonder I declined the invitation from the volleyball court, although I was a phys ed major. And beneath the white arcs, the ball painted in the sky, my classmates, Lisa and Eugene and Ick and Becky, all looked a bit alien with craniums slightly engorged and spines compressed, if not even serpentine, their limbs flailing about wildly like cuttlefish, speaking only in polysyllabics, which must have made my breathy grunts all the more apish. Who knows where the poem will lead you? I tell them to let go their reins and listen to the tongue's half-wit brilliance, the corner of the mind made light by some accidental yoking of two impossibly joined things, one or two in the rear, I notice their eyes roll into the backs of their heads and my plastic cup of root beer by now is spilling a bit while Mr. Simonoski laughs like a hyena plunging its face in a ruptured gut and nothing has ever been as clear to me as the bell that rang in my head that day. We were a 12 year experiment 
the garden variety brainiacs from a suburban school, passable genetic mixture, forgettable location, Mr. Sims' oddly large eyes and his long reptilian tail now making sense. And the way someone with an electric can opener voice seemed always to be inside him, speaking when he spoke, now making sense. As the night winds down, and the last of the cake is served writhing with some fluorescent scrawl only I seem to be able to read while all the good natures kid all the good natured kids whose fingernails are chewed raw and jaws pulse who are so good so very good and soon will be hauled into that bottomless sky under which I stumble to see which direction they're coming from and can I run and I'm going to read you one more essay to close it out. Um, yeah, I'll read this one. It's called Nicknames. <clears throat> Nicknames. I'm writing in a, in a notebook with the words, pay attention on the front, which is a cousin to another notebook in my bag with the words, pay attention, motherfucker, on it printed on a Chandler and Price letterpress that I co-own with my friend, which I have yet to see, for it is lodged in a print shop in Lubbock, Texas. My beloved co-owner pal, which makes him a kind of spouse, I suppose, who gifted me these delightful notebooks is named Boogie, or Boogs, and was so named by me, one of my greatest literary achievements. Boogie, or Boogs, might not be the first name you'd assign to Boogie, or Boogs, for a number of reasons. Perhaps the most significant of which is that he has probably, he has definitely not spent a lot of time dancing. Boogieing, which you might ascertain from his appearance, which would be a wrong thing to do, though you would be right. This is one of the reasons Boogie, or Boogs, is such a great nickname. It's a kind of curveball that has, with much repetition, become utterly natural. And his Christian name, Curtis, has come to seem awkward and clunky kind of Lutheran, kind of Kurt. It's a clothesline of a name, really, the football kind. That's a joke in there for me. Like, no one else thinks that's funny. That's the best joke. In the <laughs> it's a clothesline, the football kind. Another reason I love this nickname and have now come to love how much I love this nickname is because Boogie doesn't know that every time I say his name, I'm also invoking the great and similarly nicknamed L Boogie or Lauren Hill, whom I am guessing Wrongly, probably rightly, Boogie has never boogied to. Boogie calls me salpicon, which he tells me means sizzle, and I think that fits. Though it would be a safe assumption, given my own delight, that the nickname salpicon might afford Boogie some similarly pleasurable, ironic association, which I don't need to know about. I've shortened my nickname to picon, whatever that means. Anyway, I love nicknames. They delight me. There are evidently people from whom nicknames are repelled like projectiles from Luke Cage's skin. Fried eggs to Teflon. My friend Patrick is one, though the simple Spanishification of his name, Patricio, time to time, among some of us, is one that has endured. Sort of, time to time. Drop the pa, jiggle the spelling, and it might be a good sticky name, Patricio. One that in a generation or two might become associated incorrectly and beautifully, and so correctly with something arboreal, something to do with trees. How delightful is that? I'm a bit of a nickname magnet and have been assigned the following aliases. Bizquick, Biz, Rahim, the compassionate, Beef, Beefy, Big Man, Bigs, Biggie, Big Lil Big, Big Papa, the Big Gay, Bones, Baby Boy, Baby Gay, the Baby, Booger, Beast, Sammy, Saucy, Saucy, Sauce, Saucy Pants, Dr. Sauce, Dr. Hot Sauce, Doc, the Doctor, Tall Lady, Tall Drink, Wave, Otto's Compoyo, Ross the Boss, the King of Applesauce, Roski, Snozzer, Six, Sace, Unky, Daddy, and several others too lewd or private to share. I don't know exactly what nicknames mean, Though a quick reading of mine and the abundance of the b sound, that babyest of sounds, makes me think it might be primal. I know that I rarely call the people I love by their names. I call them, if it's okay with them, by the name I have given them. I wonder if this means I think of my beloveds as my children. That seems very patronizing. 
especially because I mostly don't give them money. But on the other hand, how lovely are my mothers, all my babies. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, that's that's wonderful. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm, I've got a lot of students here who are gonna ask you some questions. Um, hey, great. Um, but I was just gonna get things going. You've mentioned it a couple times. You talked about your mistake, and then you talked about um, the delight of a of a mistake in a poem and where that might lead you. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk to especially students. But you came to poetry. Um, how you came to poetry? Maybe some poets were you. You mentioned Thomas Lux already, but. Yeah. If you could talk about anything like that, that'd be wonderful, I think, for our students to hear. Yeah, I was like a, I was a really, um, I didn't read books as a kid. I mean, I read, I read comic books. I read um, Power Man and Iron Fist, the whole <laughs> series. <laughs> and, um, and when I was real little, I read books, but I didn't read books as a, as a bigger kid. There was one book I read in high school. It's funny because I'm just like, what, what? what were you people doing all the time in school? In school? <laughs> I'm not like that with me, because I'm kind of like, I know what I was doing, I was doing nothing. But everyone else, I guess they were reading books and stuff. I read one book and it was The Stranger, it was Camus, The Stranger. Um, but I, so I wasn't like a kid who knew he was gonna be a writer. Although I was interested in things that were, that in retrospect were writerly, you know, um, by which I mean maybe required attention, practice, um, accident, you know, wonder, stuff like that. Like, so when we were like, when I was little and, you know, knew the timing of like when the, when the raspberries would come up, like out near the school or when the mulberries would come on, like that to me is a kind of practice for a kind of attentiveness, you know, and you can think of it as many ways. It's kind of a study of rhythm actually, you know, but it's also attentive to time and it's all these other things. Um, or the ways that me and my buddy who I was talking to on the phone the other day were fucking off in school. I look back at, at that and I'm like, oh, this was practice. They were, these were like kids who didn't have a kind of um, venue for their, the ways that they wanted to kind of imagine and create. So the ways that we would mess around in school. I, and, I, and I really feel like if I was a teacher and some kids were doing that, me as me, and, and some kids were doing what we were doing, I'd be like, whoa you're a pain in the ass, but that's pretty neat, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, I'd be like, go down to the theater class and get out of my hair right now, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I um, went to college and I didn't, um, I went to college to play football and that's actually what it was. I wouldn't have gotten into the college I went to without football. Um, and I was doing poorly. I was probably depressed. I've been writing about this more. I'm like, oh, that's called being depressed, <laughs> the way I was feeling. And um, and I had a professor named David Johnson, um, who was like, you need, I, not, I was, it was maybe a survey of American literature class. And he had me read a poet named Amiri Baraka and give a presentation on Baraka. It was early Baraka, like when he was Leroy Jones. And um, I read those poems and those poems sort of like held some of the questions that I had no language for, questions about race, questions about class, questions about sort of feeling alienated um, that I had, I had no language for whatsoever. And I feel like that along with meeting some other people who were kind of arty and trying to do stuff um, was kind of how I got into it. But, you know, Baraka was an early poet. Sylvia Plath um, was a, an early poet who I really loved. Um, Mark Strand was a poet. It, it kind of makes me laugh now when I think about it like that. He was in my little early cosmos. Um, you know, Sonny Sanchez and June Jordan and, and folks like that, but um, Simon Ortiz and Joy Harjo, oh, she had some horses. That, that book was just, to me, was just, is such an important book to me and on and on and on. But yeah, I was a sophomore in college. I was a sophomore in college when I, and then I started writing. That's great. That's great. That's um, before I open it up to students, I just want to do one thing. And that is in the, in the chat that I've been getting sent from the YouTube feed here, the independent bookstore seller here in town has given you the thumbs up to write the book about the veggie burger. And so she's, she's, she's someone who would know about, about books and what's going to be out the door. So just that's a, a vote of confidence. There. Um, but I want to, op <laughs> I want to open it up to my students here. Um, 
you know, we're going to have some Zoom weirdness where you might talk over one another, but we'll deal with it. Um, but please jump in here. You got a chance to ask Roske some questions. What's on your mind? Hello. Um, I have a question. Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm going to introduce myself by my nickname, Ham Sandwich. Hey, um, good. <laughs> and um, I, have a, I have a question about when you, you use a lot of sort of disparate forms. And I was wondering when, when you write, more often, do you decide on form first or do you start writing and then kind of fall into where you want things to be? Um, I think it's probably a mix. So with the, the poems, um, occasionally I'll have a form that I know I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna start off with, you know, and occasionally like, in, in the book before catalog, I had these things called the syndromes and they were these little prose poems and they were, they were um, the form was the uh, diagnostic, you know, whatever manual, the, you know, for psychiatric disorders or whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the form. So I already had a form and, you know, with this book of essays, there was a form that I fell into and the form was to write, um, 30 minute essays, those were all drafted in 30 minutes. So there was prose, but it was a 30 minute essay. That was a formal constraint. Um, the long poem that I just finished, it's called Beholding. It's just, this is a kind of a book length poem. And that was a poem that had many sort of forms. It was a bunch of stanzas. It was one, one stanza. And then as the poem went along, I started to realize, oh, this poem needs to be centered, justified couplets to, to reference stuff about the ocean and, and also to reference stuff about a ladder and stuff, um, a railroad and a ladder at the same time. Um, so that's all. And then there are some times where it's just a kind of intuitive, where it's really, I'm, I'm writing the line where there's a kind of intuitive breath making that I'm trying to do, you know, and that, that decision about the breath, it might be kind of, kind of a cognitive thing where here's a little unit of meaning that I'm working for. And then sometimes it might be a, um, 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 a sonic thing. Like it just sounds, it just sounds right. You know, it has a sound, um, right. Um, there are ways, you know, I spend a lot of time, I get a lot of pleasure by sort of, um, by the individual line, you know, not all the time, but the individual line and how an individual line when it's broken in a certain way can have, can become like sort of doubled or tripled or contradicted by a line that follows it. I enjoy that. Um, yeah, so there's so there's the many ways, I guess. Um, I think though in catalog, I think it was mostly, I was kind of listening to the poem, you know, feeling where it wanted to break. And then I'd go back and, oh, another thing is that I drafted very many. So I would go around talking about catalog people would say the form the form the form and I would go along talking and saying all that stuff that I just said and then someone somehow my my partner she was like hey um I found this and it was a very skinny thing it was like a notebook about a little skinnier than that that thick and I drafted a third of the poems and notebooks this skinny that's a formal constraint you know so the fig there's a fig tree poem in there the to the mistake um several of those came out in the form was dictated, <laughs> you know, and then I fiddle with, with the line breaks to make them more breathless or to, you know, in some of those poems, I'd be like in those skinny poems that where the form was determined by the little, the little shape of the thing I was writing in. Then some of the revision would be to get the end words to do the breathing that I wanted the poem and the reader to do. So, and on, you know, like a, what's it called? Of and, and from those words, um, they would, I would end a line on those words, which you never do, never do. And I would end a line on those poems as a way to sort of like make you fall and be kind of breathless. And then when it would solid, get solid and end on like a book or something as a way to sort of stabilize the line and the reader and kind of an emotional state. Um, yeah, but if you write in a skinny book, it'll be a skinny poem. <laughs> Great, other questions? Let's hear them.
how has writing memory challenged you? Like specifically delving into memory, um, possibly like childhood memory. It's very hard to grasp. Sometimes it isn't even images. So how has writing memory challenged you as a poet? I love it so much. I'm just so interested in it. And I'm interested in it because I, the older I get, I'm 46, the older I get, the more I'm like, how did that happen actually? And I'm a very lucky person in that I have a brother who has a, a good memory um, and, and a memory, by a good memory, I mean a memory that's sort of, you know, useful to me, I guess. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was talking to him. <laughs> Some of the texts, I was just thinking, it would be such a good thing. <laughs> like, you know, when you're talking to your brother, like, or your sibling, or whatever, like, who's close to you, and like, um, and, and we were, <laughs> we were talking about our earliest experiences of racism, and you know, that makes for a funny, fucked up text, text. Uh, <laughs> And, and I was like, I was just thinking, man, these are such good texts. But I was texting my brother about some stuff. And I was like, you know, for those of us who imagine that we are discrete individuals, when you text your brother and be like, can you tell me my memory? And then he's like, here it is for you. It's, it's like, oh, okay, that's right. The I who, who sometimes pretends I am an I is actually not an I. You know, I, my I is only, you know, my brother is me too. Um, Anyway, that's to say, that's in part to say, like, it's really fun to me in part because it feels, the older I get, the more it actually feels like a kind of archeological procedure. Like just this morning, I'm writing about my folks and just this morning, I was like, so how did, this is before I was born, but I was asking my mother how she and my dad met, you know, how they actually met. And then sometimes again, like talking about one of my other memory, memory libraries, my mother is one of my memory libraries where things that we both experienced, I didn't, remember and she still has or vice versa. Um, so that kind of research, like actually writing about childhood as a, as a form of research is very interesting to me. And, and, and also is like a, I've been having this metaphor in my head lately about teaching and writing and, and being a person like you, you know, we, we often fix ourselves like a, you know, like a pin pin something to the wall. But I'm I'm interested in like unfixing, you know, both my idea of myself, but also what some of my memories, you know, to sort of be like, well, what, how did that happen? You know, what, what was happening? And part of that I do by sort of thinking, what are the other ways that, that um, something could have been going on, but also to ask other people, what do you think was going on in that, in that, instance, you know, which it's very possible for 40 years, I have thought one way about, you know. Um, yeah, does that get anywhere near your question? It was better than any answer I could have thought of myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Jump in, folks. Jordan, I see your hand up there. What do you got? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask. Um, so in your poetry, I see you're very honest about uh, real life events that happened. Like you did LSD in eighth grade. Like what? what is that no, like? No, 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 12th grade, 12th grade, 12th grade. 12th grade, okay, that's yeah, making well, a lot better. Much, man. That's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, is it, what is it like to, what was the first time like to write something like truly honest and what is it still hard now? Because I can't picture myself turning something in about me doing LSD. Like I'd be like, oh, what's my teacher gonna think? What if my mom sees this? You know, like what is, what is that like? Yeah, it's funny. It's really funny. Um, because, you know, you get to certain ages and certain things no longer are like, you know, naughty or you don't, you don't care. But, um, You know, I think the real thing is like the, you know, those things are just facts and they're facts that like someone might be like, you know, whatever, think you're irresponsible or something. I don't know, whatever, some, some immature, you know, <laughs> decision, evaluation of you, which is insignificant, but, you know, a more, 
there are more like, um, when I say it's insignificant, it's not at all to say that it doesn't also feel shitty and terrible and terrifying sometimes, you know, like, so I'm fully acknowledge that. Um, there are, there are, you know, sort of deeper emotional truths, like the sort of emotional truths um, about say being hurt, you know, um, or being frail, you know, um, or scared. Those are the things that are that actually feel, and with a, with a kind of clarity, um, those are the things that feel scarier um, to write and even to say. Like I'm working on this book, uh, this uh, with a friend uh, of mine and mine and Joe's uh, this kid Noah, and uh, you know, and I talk about having like sort of you know very serious emotional distress, you know? And I talk about this stuff that I've talked about out loud to three people maybe. Um, and that, you know, that feels a little, a little nervy um, or something, but it also, for that reason, it feels, um, you know, useful. Like I understand that it's gonna be useful to someone else. And I also understand that it's gonna be useful to myself, I mean, and there's this whole relationship to this stuff, but part of it is like, you know, we're ashamed of things. We're afraid of people knowing things and we're ashamed of things. And um, and there is something, depending, not always, whatever, but sometimes there's something useful to just be like, all right, that's been like in the dark for a long time. Like, just take it out and see what happens. Um, but so that's to say, like, it's, it's generally more sort of emotionally, um, uh, it's less events and more emotion, I think, probably. Um, I think, you know, although, of course, I mean, things that you're ashamed about, basically, things that, that for me, things that I'm ashamed about, um, afraid of people to know, and I'm ashamed about, those are the, those are the difficult um, things, not a thing that's been like, that I don't want, you know, like, the thing, you know, the things that your parents, you don't want your parents to know, um, not always, but some of them like, uh, you know, I took acid <laughs> at the reunion for the, for the so-called smart kids. Like that's not going to be too important, you know, but you know, the, the hurt, you know, the hurt maybe is going to be hard, you know? Yeah. So that's a long way of saying, I don't know. Lucy, go ahead. Looks I have like another question. Up. Actually, this one is suggested by my, my friend, Mary, and she wants to know, how, how do you have so much joy in your heart? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When I have the most, I mean, I wonder, I'm gonna, this, I'm gonna ask this, I'm gonna say it like a sentence, but it's a question. Um, I wonder if there's more joy in my heart when I'm, I like that phrase, first of all, joy in your heart. Um, but when I'm uh, sort of contemplating death in a, in a certain kind of way, um, cause when I think of joy, I think of it in, as, as a, you know, in tandem with, with death and stuff. Um, so I wonder if, if that, cause I don't always feel as much, you know, can I don't, you know, uh, I don't feel as in, as in the house of joy sometimes as, as others, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Jesse, did, did you, did you, uh, yeah. So, like I know you write about gardening, so I'm an amateur gardener in sports. And I think that both of these things like push you towards an expected gesture a little bit. Like there's a way we talk about nature that's like, oh, you know, like the pastoral, right? Or there's a way in certain like sports we talk about where the same language comes up time and time again to the point where like, you know, interviews are just like rinse, rinse and repeat. Yeah. And how do you 
push beyond the expected gesture in your writing or do you ever I, actually I mean I shouldn't just assume you feel this tension first off but yeah do you ever feel that tension between the expected gesture and then how do you as a writer find ways to push beyond it mm. yeah I do I do um, feel the expected gesture for sure and and partly I mean partly why sports writing is really boring to me or sports, the language around sports is really boring to me so often is because there is that exact thing. You know, me and a friend, Patrick Rosal, we started this uh, this online sports magazine called Some Call It Ballin'. And it was precisely because we were like, man, it's so fucking boring the way people talk about sports, which is interesting. I mean, sports is interesting. It's like bodies doing stuff. It's interesting, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's interesting because I sort of feel like um, sometimes I wonder if I have not pushed myself past the expected gesture. <laughs> that's sort of that's sort of when you were saying that I was like, yeah. Sometimes I I listen to those poems that sort of have a, a transcendent, you know, and then the dad turns into the tree, I, and I don't want to like ruin any of these poems for anyone. <laughs> But you know, like, and then the, and then the, there, there's sometimes there's like, and then we get to, and then there's the possibility of us getting together. And then there's the, and then we've seen, you know, there are times when I'm sort of like, am I doing that thing? You know, am I having the relationship to so-called nature that is sort of like, whatever that is, one of the versions of that is, I think that the natural world tells us how to be in a, in a kind of, uh, simplistic and maybe even like less than simplistic way. I sometimes wonder, like, I'm like, oh, is, is that just like a simple um, thing? But, you know, um, not, not like not feeling judgy at all about myself either. I just, to be clear, just to be like, it's just interesting. Like some, I'm like, oh, is that like, did I kind of, kind of get a groove and kind of, and now the poems that I'm writing are like, you know, it's a different thing where it feels like it's trying to push against something in a different kind of way um, or imagine something in a different kind of way. Um, you know, this last poem that I wrote, it's a poem Dr. J features in it. Um, and I, I, I keep revising it, you know, I keep like, it's in a book and everything, but I keep revising it and I, and then I'll read it. And it says, you know, we all know how to start. Um, um, I can't remember how it starts, but it, but I was like, oh, it can't start with a capital letter, like the beginning of a sentence. It has to start and A and D, like in the middle of something. And then there's all these little things that I just keep on like trying to figure out a way to not finish the poem or to keep it open for the possibility that it's just ongoing. It's an ongoing sort of evolving um, thing that maybe is a little bit in relation even to what you're saying, like a kind of, because I don't want, I don't want to sort of perform or imagine a kind of completeness because in some way, I think that your question suggests, oh, there's something we can complete this thing. You know, we can resolve this thing. We can complete this thing. And we can trans we can have a little transcendence thrown in too. Um, and I think I I'm curious about that, you know. And I think the yeah, this last poem, I think I'm I'm wrestling a little bit with like um with that with that question. Yeah. Does what is yeah, what do you think? Me? I, I I don't know. I think I think about it in the way that you write about why you're drawn to gardening and that there's like a you can't be finished, right? Yeah. Like it's it falls apart. It's yeah. there's cleanup. There's the I think we read the janky in our class today and the, sort of yeah. like you're moving you're moving that chair in there and right. so so when you start talking about the incompleteness that resonates in some way because all of a sudden I'm like oh okay then then you know, this idea of epiphany or transcendence or like the movement to some place becomes less important. Right. Or, you know, um, then the act of try, you know, not to come back to the essay or whatever, but the act of trying or doing something, you know? That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's sort of the, the, that's, that's, I think that's, yeah, that's sort of it. Like, um, 
like when I was even talking about like the unfinishability or the that that the, the idea of like a finished thing or a fixed thing is is um, of particular value, you know, and maybe even like a moral or spiritual value, and that's like uh, nah, I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that at all. More, what's interesting to me is the attempt, you know, the attempt, which which is um, is one. It's not transcendent, it's not fixed, and it's not great, you know. It's not, it's just, it just is. There's some, there's something about that. That I'm glad you mentioned that janky one because that one makes me, help me <laughs> clarify what I was thinking actually. Yeah. Ross, we don't want to keep you all night. Um, and I know there's more questions out there but there's just one came in from the YouTube that I think might be a great one to take us out on. Um, and um, it's from Elijah, a student here at Linfield. And uh, he says in the promotional pics, which are all over the campus and uh, online and things, um, you're wearing a shirt that says poetry is not a luxury. Mm. And he's wondering what that means to you and how that's potentially changed for you across this past year of so many things happening. Mm. Well, that's Audrey Lord's quote. Um, um, you know, basically what it means is, um, to me is, it's just so nice to say, you know, to reverse it and just to be like, well, what is poetry? Poetry is a necessity. Um, and then, you know, the next thing is like, well, what's poetry? Mm, any number of things. But one of the things that poetry is, is sort of like, a, um, I mean, I love, I love many ways of thinking about what a poem is. And like one, like Fanny Howe talks about bewilderment and a poem is, you know, our beloved Jean Valentine just died, um, I think December 29th. And, um, you know, Jean Valentine's poems, what they do, like I've been reaching for her poems a lot this last year, they hold our bewilderment. They're sort of like vessels of bewilderment. And to me, that's one of the things that a poem can do that, you know, a TV show probably doesn't, you know, a newspaper article surely doesn't, you know, but a poem can kind of hold our um, bewilderment and that's a necessity, you know, or like, um, Zagievsky has his defense of ardor. Poems are sites of ardor, you know, like sort of unabashed, um, whatever this gesture is, you know, like just bad shit for something, you know. That's, uh, that's poems are sites of ardor. Um, um, also, you know, like, you know, I'm just gonna, <laughs> Rebecca Solnit talks about, you know, being lost, like, Poems are places where you get to sort of hang out and be lost, you know. Um, I was listening to a talk by a, a poet and writer who, whose work I really, really adore um, and admire, Fred Moten. And he is talking about having sort of a difficult time with poetry right now. But at some point he talked about um, poetry. And I just I just heard him say it once, so I'm still working on it, but but I love the idea that something along the lines of like poetry at its best is about dispossession. Meaning that the way that a poem comes to be is not through, is not through the idea of a self and a self-possession. It's through a kind of um, a changing at very least, if not a kind of, um, you know, disassembly of the self so that so that the idea of possession itself um ownership gets really challenged and that one's body becomes sort of you know filled up with other bodies which which in fact we are so that poems itself poem, poetry itself reminds us that our bodies are the bodies of you know all of the people like you know even all the names that i just said that's like one thousandth of the bodies that poetic bodies that are coming through um, here. Um, so those are some things when I think of like poetry as a necessity, those are things that um, all the time, all the time um, I'm thinking a poem helps us do. You know, poems help us listen, help us pay attention, you know, um, which feels pretty big. Yo, I can take a couple more questions and I'm not in a big hurry. And I know- oh, you, oh, Okay, okay. Yeah, if you can, I know I saw some hands up. I saw Tor's hand up and I think I saw Lucy's again. Andrew's is up. So let's do those three. And if you're cool, is that yeah. all right? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Tor, take, take it away there. 
<laughs> Hi, Russ. Thank you so much for reading. That was so wonderful. You're welcome. Um, so I just, my question I have about was about, like a little bit about tone and process. Um, like you, uh, so like Joe always talks about the vertical movement of pieces where it's like kind of leaves the tactile things. And um, I feel like your poems always start out with such direct images. And then eventually there's some moment where there's like an aside or um, something just we talked about honesty earlier too, as well. I guess like those asides feel really honest. Mm. Um, and then it moves into something else. Uh, and I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about how you do that so well and seamlessly. You know, I just try, I do a lot of it bad, you know, and then probably like, <laughs> I just try a lot of it. It doesn't work. And then I'm like, okay, that worked. Um, but there is this thing that you're talking about. Um, I mean, I think like a variation in a variation in um, voice is very interesting to me. You know, it's like interesting and also like real to me. So that um, the same person who might, you know, you know, we we have we speak many sort of registers and many sort of kinds of language, whatever we speak. You know, it, it happens all the time. So it might be a kind of deeply interior. Um, you know, um, dream-like speech that in, in two seconds could turn into, you know, like you're watching the basketball game or like you're reporting on the basketball game. And then two seconds later, you might be talking to your mother, you know, who's been dead for four years. And then two seconds later, you might be talking to, you know, you know, your neighbor and, or yourself. And that's just, to me, that's just like real life. You know, that's like how, how we actually kind of function. Um, trying to get it there on a, on a page and not have it be just completely incoherent is it's, it's sort of challenging. And, you know, it's kind of like, depends on what's pleasurable, I think to you. And I get a lot of pleasure when a voice just to, gets, you know, I like inconsistency actually, you know, there's a lot of sort of talk often about like, um, I remember when I would teach and I would sort of talk about this is inconsistent. You know what? People are inconsistent. <laughs> voices are inconsistent. So there's there's ways that when a voice, you know, say go is talking in a certain thing and then addresses the reader explicitly, that's going to be interesting to me. Or that a version of that is going to be interesting to me. You know, um, there's a poem that I love by Ira Sadoff called Grazing, and he has this moment where he says. Uh, he says something and then after he says it, he says, I'm trying to bring you closer. And, and it's a poem that's a pretty heady poem. And it's a, and, but that was this moment where he's, he's, try, he's trying to get a little sentimental. And then he's like, I want you to know, I was just trying to get a little sentimental. I, this is feeling, you know? It's so beautiful to me. And it's beautiful in part because it's like, it's doing this whole other thing. And then he's like, he like taps you on the forearm. And he's like, hey, hey. Um, yeah, but you know, like I'm writing prose now, I'm writing this longer prose thing and, and I've been trying to like find the voice so hard, trying to find like who's the, cause when I feel like I'm writing real good, um, there's some, I'm talking to someone, I'm really talking to someone. And, um, in the delights, I, I was getting a voice pretty good and I, and I realized, um, Part of the voice is like a humor, the, some of the way that the, the humor is working. And I realized that some of that is, my ear is so connected to my brother, you know? And my brother, you know, like we're, we're real tight. We're real like sort of, you know, genetically, like we're like with each other, you know? Like even though he's not here right now, we're with each other. We might not talk on the phone for months and months, you know? But boom, you know, we get together and we play Pictionary, we're gonna fucking win. Like you just, that's how it goes, you know? and. <laughs> And um, my humor is so tuned to my brother, it's unreal. So we were sort of like, part of our little text thing today was like, we were, <laughs> I'm not even gonna say that. But we were like, we were kind of like doing this little riff, this little joke. Um, and I was like, it's my brother. I'm, tr I'm trying to make this thing. And it's my brother whose who's laughter I'm actually listening for, you know? Um, 
So trying to hear those voices or, or even like make up those voices, you know? So this, 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 this stuff that I'm writing now, which is about land, but it's about family, it's about all this stuff. Like for a while I was like, is there a kind of address? Like, you know, a lot of these sort of like actual address books, like uh, Casey Lehman's book, Heavy, or um, Imani Perry's book to her kid, her son's Breathe, it's called, or, you know, there's so many books that are sort of like um, addresses, ta Coates' book. Um, and they're ways of like sort of getting getting a voice, you know, getting a voice that is like potent and, um, you know, kind of penetrating. Like when you're talking to someone, it gets serious real fast, you know. That's why letters are, you know, some of the most interesting, interesting things to read as far as I'm concerned, you know, because it's like not, it's not to the idea of literature you're writing or not just some vague, it's like, you know, my cousin Sue, I got to write her a letter. I'm going to talk about real things, specific things. About her, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question? We good? All right, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'm also in Jesse's um, nonfiction class. So, so I read um, Book of Delights as well as Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. And we, we've actually been talking recently about um, like lingering on on words and on sounds and sort of mm. bringing the poetic into um, the essay. So it's not so much of um, like a narrative, but a, like you had mentioned, bewilderment and, and exploration. Mm. So, you know, aside from the, the formal constraints, um, what, when you're writing an essay versus writing a poem, like for example, I find Lily on the Pants to be really, really poetic because of the way it starts with something so little. And Jesse had, had said this in class and tendrils out to um, something larger, I love that word. Um, so what is, I guess how much of a, a separation is there between essay and poetry to you? Because they can do very similar things. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I think the real thing um, I was just going to I was just going to answer like I really have an answer, but I don't really have an answer, but I'm going to answer like I have an answer. One thing is like form, you know, the form is one of the things, you know, like you don't have a line break in a poem in, a, in an essay and you don't have a stanza break exactly in an essay. Um, you know, there's different relationships depending on what kind of writer you are between the line and the sentence, you know. Um, but a lot of the things you can do that, you know, essays, essays can kind of accommodate a lot of the things that a poem can do. And, and, you know, depending on the kind of essay you're writing or trying to read and, um, and, or the kind of poem, um, but yeah, that's, that's neat. That Lily on the pants one, um, that's really like a poem. It's, it's like a, um, kind of a prose poem kind of thing, which is very different than a, poem that's kind of meandering toward a, not an argument, but meandering toward a kind of, you know, thinking of like the, the long one, long one, the essay loitering or, you know, where there's a kind of, you know, there's evidence and there's kind of meditating on a thing. And um, yeah. Um, the other thing that, you know, writing essays, you know, the word essay, I mean, it is, it's really just an attempt, you know? And in that way, like to me, the essay is the openest form, literary form that there is. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know that there's something that's more open than the form that calls itself an attempt, you know? So that really, like, if you did a dance and said, that's an essay, it's like, I guess that's an essay, you know? Um, which is to say, I think we often think of, poems, particularly like if maybe if we're, we're not formalists or kind of new to poems, we, we think of poems as being um, especially open or formless. But to me, the essay is really the, the open form, you know, it's the formless form. And, um, and I think maybe that's partly why I'm so drawn to them now is that they just feel, they feel like pure experiment you know, and very difficult in that way, you know, like you don't have a thing kind of 
you know, I'm button up against the line that, you know. <laughs> that, you, you couldn't draft an essay in a little skinny notebook. <laughs> you could. You could. You could have skinny essays. It's just you an attempt. You, know what, you could. You totally could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try that. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the other thing is that, like, I was reading and am reading always, like, really beautiful essayists. So, you know, folks like Brian Blanchfield is a is an essayist whose work I love. And Hilton Alls is, um, he just has what I think is like one of the best, um, his book, White Girls, but he has a, a long, like an 80 page essay at the beginning of that book that is just, it's just below, I just can't, I can't get my head around it. It's so beautiful. Um, Margot Jefferson's work, Terrence Hayes, beautiful poet, um, has a beautiful um, book of it's a kind of kind of a memoir with the poet um, about the poet Ethers Knight um, to float in the space between it's called and it's just beautiful beautiful poetic prose that could also go into like a kind of narrative and almost reportage kind of stuff um, yeah so you know like I read a lot of I read a lot of nonfiction uh, Amy Leach is she is she how out west, I, I kind of feel like maybe she's a westerner. Last I knew, she was in Montana somewhere. But yeah, what an essayist! Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, those are amazing essays, and just like, I mean, the the poetry of the language is just so, you know. There. I think we we're nearing our time, but Andrew, I know you had your hand up. Take us take us home here with one last question. All right. So um, I'm in Jesse's intro class, and. Um, we were also reading Book of Delights, um, and we were sort of doing um, we were writing, doing writing exercises, sort of um, in a similar um, form to Book of Delights. And while we were doing that exercise, we were sort of talking about how, you know, you have you know artistic, free flowing, uh, you know, literary language, and then um, sometimes you might um, juxtapose um, more like you know scientific, clinical. Um, or sort of that kind of language that sort of um, causes tension with the free-flowing um, artistic uh, lyric form of the literary language. Um, and I noticed in one of your, um, the poems you read that um, you had seamlessly put in like the word antiseptic with um, your work. And like that for me is sort of like, you know, more of like a clinical scientific word. Um, so I was wondering how you like so seamlessly like combine the sort of scientific world with the you know artistic literary world while still maintaining um such a lyric form in your poetry yeah great question um it comes back a little bit to that question of of registers you know um there's something really it's actually yeah i mean so one of the things is that that i'm that i'm my first audience and i always have to remember that um but I'm trying to write shit that delights me. You know, I'm trying to write shit that's just like so interesting to me. And so that like, you know, I knew that something was good going on today because I was writing something and I was like, damn, damn, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was just like something just hit, you know? It was a little funny. It was like a little joke that I was <laughs> in a, not a very jokey place in a piece. And it was actually, what it was was like a shift in tone. And the shift in tone had a joke and I was just like, man, and I'm giving myself a little rule of like not sharing any of this work for like a couple of weeks. And I'm like, damn, this is so hard. Cause my favorite thing is to like write something. And then if it's really good to be like, hey, can I read you? <laughs> but anyway, um, so partly what that is, is just like, yeah, finding those, um, you know, those registers, those kind of um, register for me, registers that kind of butt up against each other. And sometimes it's just like how we talk, like we just do have a bunch of registers. But sometimes to me, there's just, there's a way that I, I, as you ask the question, I realize, and as I'm talking, I realized I do like to sometimes dramatize that, you know, and sort of like put a little bit of a light on how funny it can be actually to one moment be like talking like you're talking to your best friend and the next moment talk like you're an economist or something. You know, that's, that's really interesting to me. And it's interesting in part because, you know, like it's jarring and it's jarring like, you know, funny is the word, but I think um, it pleasurable is also the word. There's also the word curiosity just flew into my head. And I think it's sort of like, by having these things that are not perfectly predictable, not inconsistent, then 
pieces become more curious, I think as a writer, but also as a reader, you know, like you don't know exactly what you're going to get. And so when someone doesn't sound like them, to me, that's like, that's great. Like, whoa, suddenly you sound exactly like, I don't know, you know, T.S. Eliot, how weird, how weird is that, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna go with it, you know? Like, I'm probably gonna go with it more than if you just sounded like yourself, as long as you come back to, to something else, you know? <laughs> don't, as long as you're not T.S. Eliot the whole, the whole time. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I would respond to that question, yeah. Thank you. Ross, thank you so much for your reading, for your generosity with these questions. Um, I know we're going to uh, have a lot to talk about in classes for the rest of the week, the rest of the semester. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's good to see you. And All right. thanks, thanks, everyone, for being here. Good night, everyone. Bye, Ross. <laughs>